Good afternoon. I know that I'm the only obstacle between you and lunch, so I'll try and not uh, take more of your time than is needed. Um, I'm talking only about uh, surgically implanted uh, uh, valves. Uh, we know now from the previous talks that there is a problem of paravalvular leak in, in uh, TAVI, uh, but this is not the topic that I'm going to, uh, to cover. Uh, minor leaks can be found in quite a fair number of uh, prosthetic valves, but those that are clinically important are about 3% three, three of, uh, of all valves, and the incidence increases the more valve replacements have taken place, and also with infective endocarditis in a severely calcified uh, mitral annulus, and uh, paradoxically, but very importantly, the incidence of paravalvular leak is highest in those patients who had valve replacement to repair a paravalvular leak. So that's very important to bear in mind when we are approaching a patient uh, to uh, close the paravalvular leak and we have to choose between the transcatheter approach and a further operation. We have two major problems in paravalvular leaks. The smaller and medium-sized ones cause mainly hemolysis. It might sound like a not, not a very important issue, but those patients are severely symptomatic. They need repeated blood transfusions. It gets more and more difficult with time to do a cross-match, and they are really uh, very symptomatic from sometimes not a very big leak. Those who have big leaks get congestive heart failure, sometimes devastating heart failure with severe pulmonary hypertension. So uh, these are uh, very, very sick patients, and many of the patients that we have treated have been old, sick, pulmonary hypertensive, and in bad heart failure. And many patients will have a combination of both anemia, hemolytic anemia, and heart, and heart failure. Now, uh, it is not easy to quantitate the severity of the leak with standard echo parameters of mitral regurgitation. We had some talks earlier on. And uh, in general, I would say that the severity is often underestimated. So the decision to intervene should be based mainly on clinical parameters rather than uh, size or uh, assess the severity of the leak. And uh, it's very difficult to get a good idea of the leak in uh, the mitral position from transthoracic echo. And it can happen quite often that we can't see any leak on transthoracic echo. So if we have a, a suspicion the patient has a heart failure, which is unexplained, and it has a prosthetic valve, we should do a TEE in the, for the purpose of uh, making the diagnosis. Uh, so for the mitral uh, valve, a TEE is the method of choice, but it is uh, less than ideal for the uh, prosthetic aortic valve so for those, often we can uh, manage uh, without TEE, just by transthoracic echo, as I uh, delineate uh, later. And uh, some people advocated using CT or MRI to get the exact shape and size and, and uh, number of leaks around the valve, but we didn't find that very helpful. We don't use it routinely. Now, it's a, the transcatheter approach to paravalvular leak is a fairly complex procedure, and there are several uh, approaches to the leak, and we have to be prepared to switch from one approach to the other during the procedure, so we have to get all the equipment uh, ready for all alternative approaches. And it's a, a long uh, procedure, so uh, we need... Uh, uh, hemodynamic monitoring, arterial line, and uh, often it's required to have a urinary catheter because it can last three and four hours sometimes. And of course, we need all the uh, the, uh, the, si the right size of uh, and length of sheet. That's especially for the transaortic approach, and especially if we go to the mitral transaortically, then we need very long catheters and delivery systems that mostly aren't available, so we have to compromise and do all kinds of tricks. The setting for the uh, usual approach is in the regular cath lab, but because we need a general anesthesia and we need the echo machine, we need to get them out of the system, so we need all the uh, pictures to be displayed on the central monitor so that we don't have to look across the shoulder of the uh, operators to see the 
uh, the screen of the echo machine on, in the corner, but it has to be in front of us. And we need to ask this, the anesthetist to use long tubes so that his trolley gets away, because then you start uh, shifting the x-ray tube and you get uh, obstacles. We, for the purpose of uh, closing paravalvular leaks, bioprosthetic valves are by far superior because they don't get stuck when we put the device in, as I'll show you. Uh, aortic leaks are almost always uh, closed with a, a retrograde approach. It requires, as I said, long sheets, especially in tall adults. We have to take it into consideration. And uh, we often use uh, transthoracic or ice. We have been using ice several times uh, quite successfully for this uh, procedure, so it obviates the general anesthetic, which is good. We do use dye. We do use contrast material for aortic leaks because it's really very good to delineate the leak. As you can see on this uh, demonstration here, you can see, I hope, yeah, you can see over here a posterior leak next to the left coronary cusp quite clearly. And this is how we do it when we monitor it with transthoracic echo. You can see the catheter in the LV. This is the tip of the device. This was still an old-fashioned uh, ADO uh, amplitzer duct occluder. Now it is pulled back into the position. You see it's a posterior leak. This is the valve. This is the device. And here you can see very little uh, color flow around the device. So that's a good result. Uh, we have to be careful uh, not to do autography when we deliver the device with a straight catheter because this is very misleading. If we have a high power injection in the aortic root, it will go through the valve during systole and we, it will give us an impression of terrible aortic regurgitation as if our device is not sitting properly. So either you have to put a pigtail into from another arterial puncture or just rely on the echocardiographic result. Now, it's always important to use exchange length wires because we can sometimes get a, a floppy wire, a terumo wire through the, uh, through the leak, but then the catheter will not follow because it, it may be very tortuous. And it will, it's very unfortunate if you have to lose position and retry to cross again because you didn't use an exchange length to begin with. This is the typical paramitral leak, you can see on the left the color appearance, which is always, almost always from the uh, short dimension of the leak, which is uh, one of the reasons we are underestimating the severity. And here you can see the valve and the paravalvular crescent shape, which is the most common shape of these leaks. Now, uh, for mitral valves, we always do TE, we use 3D TE under general anesthetic. We always have a, a, a preparatory TE in the echo lab to know exactly what we are going to close, to know the size, the position, and the number of leaks that we want to close. And uh, we don't use angiography at all. So for paramitral leaks, we have done many of those. We don't use dye only the echo monitoring and the fluoroscopy. Now, usually we use the transeptal approach, uh, but we have to take into consideration that these people had several previous operations, and often the mitral valve is approached surgically through the atrial septum. So this atrial septum may have been opened and closed several times. It may be even patched or tightly sutured, and it's sometimes very difficult to cross. So we may plan to cross it superiorly or posteriorly or all kinds of things. And then we, after struggling for 30, 40 minutes, we are happy that we crossed it somewhere. So it's not always that easy. And uh, if we uh, can't do it from the transeptal approach, the other way to go is go retrogradely from the aorta. It's easier to cross in several positions and also we go with the wire, with, with the mitral regurgitant flow. So it takes our floppy wire across the leak easier than when you come from the atrium and you have to go against the uh, current, against the jet. So uh, then after having crossed from the left ventricle to the left atrium, we still have two ways to go. 
we can either snare the wire from the left atrium, uh, snare it out the femoral vein, and then go anti-gradely, as, as if we would have done uh, going uh, transeptally to begin with, or we can do the entire procedure from the retrograde approach. And in some cases, either if we have a mechanical aortic valve that obviates the way, uh, it doesn't allow us to do a trans-aortic approach, if we have a difficult trans-atrial uh, uh, approach, or if we have multiple leaks, or in, in bad anatomical positions that are difficult to cross, we can choose the trans-apical approach. We do it in a hybrid cath lab with the surgeons opening the chest, preparing the apex, introducing the uh, sheet, and then we do the rest, which is usually not that difficult because you have a straight line from the apex to the leak. It's easier to use uh, if you have to do several leaks in one, in one go. It's sometimes the preferred approach uh, to begin with. There is one lab that I know, maybe there are more, but one is in Lenox Hill uh, by Ka Professor Carlos Ruiz, who has done now more than 100 in a completely transcutaneous, transapical uh, approach. This uh, needs a lot of uh, sophisticated registration of CT images on the fluoroscopy, and then you also have to seal your way out from the left ventricle by putting some amplitzer devices in the myocardium and some glue in the tract from the myocardium out in the skin, but he has done it successfully, so um, I have to mention it. Talking about state of the art, we, maybe we can get there once in the future. Now, the ones that are easier to close in the mitral position are the lateral ones, those next to the left atrial appendage. That's, uh, these ones uh, are usually done uh, transeptally. The mean ones are the ones that are posteromedial next to the atrial septum because we cross the septum and then we have to close a hole that's very ne near the septum. So we have to do all kinds of uh, U-turns and uh, uh, difficult maneuvers of the catheters. And then if we are successful getting the wire through, often the equipment will not follow. So that's quite a cumbersome thing to do. We can use some uh, things that uh, might be helpful. This is an Agilis sheet uh, meant for electrophysiology. It's a steerable tip. So if you introduce it far away from the valve, you can have much more maneuverability, and we have used it several times successfully. You also have a lubricator or, or the hydrophilic sheet that enable better passage through. We have to remember, this is a tear of tissue. This is not an ASD or VSD with nice round uh, shape. This is a rugged surface, and it's very difficult to get the equipment through even if it's a fairly uh, large uh, uh, hole. So these sheets may be helpful, the Turumo Destination or the Cook Shuttle. But one very important thing to know is if you manage to choose a smaller sheet by one size, it's sometimes much easier to get through than with a sort of so-called uh, specialty designed uh, sheet, which is larger. So we need to try and get the smallest device that will do the job. By far now, we are using the uh, Amplitzer Plug 3 that's been used now extensively all over, the, uh, all over Europe and other places, and uh, the only place that's not available is in the United States. It's a rectangular shape, so it's much, it fits much better into the uh, leak, and since we have been using those, the uh, amount of uh, residual leak has decreased uh, very significantly. We hardly see now uh, residual leaks using this device. It's also a very uh, thin and soft mesh device compared to the previous uh, devices. Um, in America, they use, uh, use now mostly the Amplitzer Plug 2 that shares the same uh, physical properties with the Plug 3, but it's a round one. So for most of the leaks, they have to introduce more than one. And they have all kinds of techniques to uh, enable uh, putting more than one device without having to reintroduce the uh, wire again every time. And sometimes you need to uh, improvise and do all kinds of tricks to get uh, the job done. This is a PFM coil. 
it's meant for a, a night occlude call for ductuses. And I, I can show you uh, in this case, we have done a, a Amplatzer plug three in the paravalvular leak. You can see the device over here. And you can see that the immediate post-implantation result is very satisfactory. But several months later, the patient became uh, more, uh, more symptomatic. And we can see that now a, a channel has opened just adjacent to the uh, plug three. So we had to introduce another plug in the same in the same uh, location. And we were quite worried that a bulky Amplatzer plug three that we'll put together with the one that's there will, uh, might even dislodge the previous one and embolize it. So we uh, chose this night occlude uh, coil. You see the wire going next to the uh, Amplatzer plug three. Here we are now starting to create a coil in the left ventricle. Now we are pulling it back into the channel. And here you can see the final result, the coil next to the Amplatzer plug three. And you can see that again, the hole is now uh, sealed quite nicely. But in order not to mislead you that all is good and there's no problem, I'll show you one case that is very, very frustrating. So this is a patient who had a very bad leak that was posteromedial next to the atrial septum. The only way that we could cross the septum was very shallow next to the, the valve. So you, you see our sheet, transatrial sheet, now transseptal sheet going parallel to the valve. If the leak would have been here, a lateral one, we could have managed it, but the leak was here. There was no way we could get our catheter there. So we went retrogradely from the aorta. We crossed the leak. Now the wire is in the pulmonary vein. You can see it here in 3D, the wire crossing. Now we are snaring the wire. And now we have a very nice AV loop. This goes from the femoral vein to the femoral artery through the leak. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the uh, very sharp angulation over here and the very rugged uh, surface of the leak didn't allow the specialty terumo uh, destination sheet to follow the uh, dilator. We had to abandon this, but we didn't give up. So we went retrogradely again, deciding to close it retrogradely. And here is the plug three in the left atrium. So we are now closing it the other way around with a retention disc in the left atrium. We now know that this is a problem and uh, I think uh, the Amplatzer plug three is much better suited for anti-grade closure than retrograde closure. And as you can see, we are pulling the device backwards to the, to the valve. Now, when it's released and completely, as you can see now, one disc is moving freely, but this disc is now trapped by the device, but we didn't give up, so we went through again. And this time we put it so distal into the left atrium that only the retention disc uh, was in the channel. This was not considered a, a good position, so we get, gave it another chance, and we put it again. And now, look what we are trying to do. We are trying to do all kinds of maneuvers and manipulation to get the tail of the device away from the valve, but this was not successful. So after all you have seen, we had to abandon without uh, closing the, the power valve leak. So I would just like to uh, end my talk saying that it's not only the technique that is state of the art, but in my view, the state of the art approach to paravalvular leak should be transcatheter closure rather than reoperation. Thank you for your attention. Any questions from the audience?